Hello students, welcome to our webinar series where we have covered the anatomy lectures as well as a cardio topic and today we are dealing with a very important topic in exercise therapy which is science and art of PNF. So what is PNF? PNF is nothing but proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So guys, uh, I don't know uh, what student population have joined today's session. Uh, because this topic, uh, you guys will understand if you are in second year. First years, uh, we have anatomy of muscle spindle and Golgi tendon organ. So we will start with the basics and then we will cover what are the different facilitation techniques in PN. So starting with the first slide, uh, introduction, how to apply PNF in what all uh, patient population we are applying PNF that we are going to study and presents for the quiz winners. After this session, we will share a quiz form with you. So those who did not join our WhatsApp group, kindly go and join our WhatsApp group, which is shared in the comment section. The link is shared. So join our WhatsApp group and there will be a certificate of participation who will stay till the last. And please drop us your email ID so, such that we can send you certificate of participation. What are we going to study in our today's session? WW of PNF. What it is? It is what is PNF? When are we applying this PNF? And why are we applying this PNF techniques? Then we are going to deal with physiology of PNF. What is the scope of proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation? And what are the different principles in PNF? So uh, to understand that, you have to understand what is the physiology behind proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Then only you will be able to understand how actually PNF works. So a question popping up on your screen. Physiotherapy is solely exercise based. Is it true or false? Comment down in the comment section. Is physiotherapy solely exercise based? True or false? Let us know what are your views on this. So, starting with the topic, what is PNF? Uh, let us break down this PNF. P is proprioceptive, N is neuromuscular, and F is facilitation. So, if this question is asked in your exam, you can write it in this way. Proprioceptive, as you know that prop, there are proprioceptors in our body like other uh, receptors, which are mechanoceptors, thermoreceptors, photoreceptors. So like that, proprioceptors are the receptors which carries the sensory information from your muscle and joints. So proprioceptors gives you the information which is concerning about the movement and the position of the body. See, if I close my eyes and if a therapist or someone moves my hand through some joint range of motion. With closing my eyes, as you know that my eyes have been occluded, but still I will be able to tell that my hand is in 45 degrees of flexion or my elbow is in 90 degrees of flexion. How am I able to tell that? That is due to proprioception. So what exactly is present in my muscles which is helping my brain to understand what exactly is happening in my muscle. So that is nothing but your proprioception. Neuromuscular as the name itself is telling that neurons are involved and your muscles. So it involves nerves and muscles. Facilitation means making the movement easier. It is facilitation. So PNF, it is an integrated approach in which the treatment is directed towards the a total human being, not just single body segment. See, we use PNF for each single body segment, but it is a wholesome approach. See, if a patient is coming to you with stroke, if a patient is coming to you with facial nerve palsy, if a patient is coming to you with any uh, uh, muscle weakness, paralysis, in such cases also we are giving PNF techniques, which we will study in our further slides. Treatment approach is always positive. So here... PNF is a painless technique that is while doing these treatment techniques, the patient will not experience any pain. So it is safe. You can use PNF. Uh, it reinforces and uses different techniques which are very comfortable for uh, patient and it involves physical as well as psychological 
well-being of a patient. So the treatment approach is always positive. The primary goal of the treatment is to help the patients achieve their highest level of function. So the techniques we will learn in our further slides. Another question, identify the person in the image, the uh, person you are, uh, which you are seeing on the uh, screen. Let me know who he is. Dr. Sherrington, Herman Kabat, Fred Smith, or Carol Gobat. Comment down the answer. Now, what is the history of PNF? Proprioceptive facilitation was first developed by Dr. Herman Kabat, who he was. He was a neurophysiologist. Uh, in 1940s, in, in his 1940s, he developed the, this technique known as proprioceptive facilitation. Then Dorothy was in 1944, in 1954, added a term which was coined as neuromuscular. Before that, Herman Kabard named it as proprioceptive facilitation. Proprioception is right, okay. But where are the proprioceptors located? That's the reason why she added neuromuscular in that. Hence, it became proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. This was first implemented in Australia by Sister Elizabeth Kenny on which patient population? It was first implemented on poliomyelitis patient. In 1947, in 1945, saw Maggie Knott, uh, with, who is also known as Margaret Knott, first physical therapist along with Dr. Kabat to start applying PNF. So Dr. Herman Kabat has, uh, with Margaret Knott, with the help of Dr. Herman Kabat, uh, started this PNF technique. So she started applying PNF on the, uh, all the patient population, starting with poliomyelitis. So now starting with physiology of PNF, and we all know that there are something known as muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. So, okay. So, as you all know that we have something known as muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. So, these muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs are located in your muscle. Okay. So, there are something known as extrafusal fibers and intrafusal fibers, which we have studied in our anatomy and physiology first year. We have also studied about nuclear back fibers, nuclear chain fibers. What are those uh, uh, fibers? We will also study about that. So the image which you can see here, this one, this is a microscopic picture of your muscle spindle. So muscle spindle has extrafusal fibers, intrafusal fibers and sensory part as well as motor part. So among this, which is sensory, which is motor, I will tell you. So I have told you, right? Uh, like mechanoreceptors, like thermoreceptors, right? like photoreceptors, there are something known as proprioceptors. So proprioceptors is nothing but position of your joint in uh, muscles and joint in this space. Okay. There is something known as conscious proprioception and there is something known as unconscious proprioception. Consciously, your body is uh, uh, your body is in a controlled way because of proprioception. So your conscious proprioception is controlled by dorsal co dorsal column medial lemniscal system, and your unconscious proprioception is preserved by whom your cerebellum. Okay, so make a note of this that there is dorsal column medial lemniscal system and uh, your cerebellum, which are responsible for conscious proprioception and unconscious proprioception. So proprioce uh, proprioception uh, comes into picture when there is change in muscle length or muscle tension. So in your uh, muscle, in your muscle, what are the structures which are responsible for change in length and change in tension? The so change in length is uh, observed by whom? By your muscle spindle. And change in tension is seen by whom? Golgi tendon organ. Okay. So let us see how a muscle belly is organized. It is having muscle tendon organ, uh, sorry, Golgi tendon organ, which is present in the tendons. So your Golgi tendon organ is situated here in the tendon. Okay. As well as here. So here will be your G 
teeth or present golgi tendon organ and here this is your muscle spindle okay in muscle spindle you have your muscle has extrafusal fibers and this is your intrafusal fibers nothing but your muscle spindle okay so this is the sensory part of your muscle so the intrafusal fibers are the sensory part of your muscle spindle so intrafusal fibers again have two uh, nucleus nuclear two fibers nuclear bag fibers and nuclear chain fibers so as the name itself is telling you that nuclear bag fibers means it is having a small bulk or a swollen part in between so these this is the nuclear bag fiber and this is the nuclear chain fiber and surrounding that you have the efferents which take the impulse from these bag fibers and chain fibers which we will study in detail because uh, this you have to understand before knowing what pnf is okay so this nuclear bag fibers as you can see this part a swollen part in between that is or the bulging that is a nuclear bag fiber and these are the nuclear chain fiber so these are the polar ends of the nuclear chain fibers these are the polar ends of the nuclear bag fibers okay so uh what happens is there are efferent nerve endings and efferent nerve endings efferent is responsible for taking sensory information from the muscle to the central nervous system and efferent is responsible for taking the motor responses and it gives the motor responses to the muscle okay efferent so here efferent we have sensory part as i have told you in sensory we have uh, nuclear bag fibers and nuclear chain fibers right so from the nuclear bag fibers and chain fibers there are efferents 1a 1b and 2 coming out okay so 1b is majorly carried by 1b carries the information from the golgi tendon organ okay and 1a and 2 carries the sensory information from the nuclear fibers nuclear bag fibers and chain fibers okay so this is 1a and 2 and this golgi tendon organs sensation is carried by 1b fibers okay understood till here so we have studied about a muscle in the muscle you have something known as muscle spindle which is again your sensory part okay so that part has extrafusal fibers and intrafusal fibers as the name itself is telling you that intrafusal fibers are present inside and extrafusal fibers are present parallelly outside the intrafusal fibers okay intrafusal fibers again has nuclear bag fibers and chain fibers and attaching to that is your efferent nerves with efferent obviously it is taking the sensory information to the central nervous system so it has 1a 1b and 2 efferent nerves 1a and 2 are taking the information from the nuclear fibers a uh, bag fibers and chain fibers 1b is taking the information from golgi tendon organ okay so when your golgi tendon organ is stimulated the information is taken by whom it is taken by 1b efferent fibers when your muscle spindle that is your intrafusal fibers nuclear bag fibers and chain fibers are stimulated they are the information is taken by which uh, fibers 1a fibers and 2 fibers okay from here where is the information going it is going to the spinal cord okay so in our next slide so here as you can see that there is a spinal cord this is the transverse section of the spinal cord as you can see here this is the transverse section of the spinal cord okay so this is the muscle spindle in the, this is a muscle in which your muscle spindle which is the sensory part of a muscle was situated and it acted as a proprioceptor okay so here 
the information from here, this is the efferent nerve. This is carried by the 1A and 2 fibers from the muscle spindle. So the muscle spindles are present in the belly of the muscle. And this is the Golgi tendon organ. Okay. From here, 1B efferent nerve has taken the information. So first, let me finish the uh, muscle spindle. Ka thing. From here, the information went. So this is the, uh, sorry. From here, the information went. This is the dorsal column. This is the dorsal root ganglion because all the sensory information from our body goes through the dorsal root. Okay. That is from the posterior aspect. It entered the spinal cord. Here, it stimulated interneuron. It stimulated this interneuron and the another neuron that is your efferent neuron got activated and it takes down the information and it, up, and it supplies to extrafusal fibers as well as intrafusal fibers. Okay, so extrafusal fibers has the major contractile part. So when your muscle is contracting, major contractile part is present with your extrafusal fibers because it has more actin and myosin content. Your intrafusal fiber majorly acts as a sensory part. Okay, but it also has the ability to contract, but lesser ability to contract when compared to extrafusal fibers. Okay, so what are the fiber? What are the names of the fibers which are giving the efferents to the extrafusal and intrafusal fibers? So extrafusal fibers are activated by alpha motor neuron and intrafusal fibers are activated by gamma motor neuron. Okay. So, this is known as alpha-gamma co-activation. Okay. So, this is about the activation of the muscle spindle. It went to the spinal cord. From there, the motor efferent came and then the contraction of the muscle happened. When the Golgi tendon organ is stimulated, that is when you apply more tension to the Golgi tendon organ. See, when I am stretching my fingers like this, this minor stretch is stimulating what? My muscle spindles, obviously. So this stretch, this normal change in the length will stimulate your muscle spindles. If someone is uh, keeping a pile of books on my, if they are putting pile of books on my forearms, what happens if you keep you kept one book? I will be able to take two, three. It will turn into isometric contractions of my biceps muscle. Okay, then after that, it is stimulating which organ? It is stimulating the Golgi tendon organ because Golgi tendon organ is uh, stimulated by the tension. So Golgi tendon organ, uh, so the Golgi tendon organ senses the uh, tension which is built up in the Golgi tendon organ due to any external pressure or because of any stretch. Okay, so both these go hand in hand, Golgi tendon organ as well as by uh, as well as your muscle spindles. Okay. So these Golgi tendon organ 1B fibers are taking the information and it is reaching again to this part through dorsal root. It is reaching the spinal cord again from here your alpha and gamma neurons are getting fired and your muscle will contract. So in PNF how are we using it? See when we are stretching when we are applying any PNF stretch what happens is uh, if I am stretching my shoulder flexors. Okay. What happens here is my these muscles will get stretched. Okay. So the information from this muscle spindle will go to the uh, spinal cord and what it will do is it will cause relaxation of this and it will cause contraction of opposite group of muscles. Okay. Then only your stretching is happening. When it is over stretching, the same uh, 1A and 2 fibers are reaching to your spinal cord and they are asking your spinal cord to stop the stretching because it will cause damage to that part. Then what our spinal cord will do? Our spinal cord will inhibit the stretching and it will, uh, it will inhibit the stretching and it will contract it because it will shorten in length, right? And it will lengthen in length. This is known as reciprocal inhibition. That is contraction of one group of muscles while inhibition of another opposite group of muscle is nothing but your reciprocal inhibition. So on this basis, your PNF is working. There are different other, uh, there are different other uh, physiological bases also, which is out of the scope of this webinar, because uh, we have to teach you in depth, which we will cover in our next webinar series. Okay.
I hope you understood the, uh, what is muscle spindle, what are uh, what is the Golgi tendon or organ, and there is something known as static stretch and dynamic stretch. If uh, uh, static stretching is nothing but slow stretching, or when you are putting the muscle in a stretched position, it will cause stimulation of static nuclear back fibers. So nuclear back fibers are also two types: static nuclear back fibers and dynamic nuclear back fibers. So static nuclear back fibers are stimulated when we are stretching a muscle very slowly or we are putting it in a sustained position. Dynamic response is a fast stretch. We are uh, stretching the uh, joint or lip in a faster manner. That is where your fast stretch comes into the picture and your uh, fast nuclear back fibers will respond. So this is about the physiology of muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. From here, Gayatri ma'am will take, uh, ma'am will correlate muscle spindle and Golgi tendon organ and how are, how is this physiology applied to your PNF techniques? Hello, hi and good evening. I hope I've put decent enough makeup not to look too old, but also not too much of makeup that to scare you. My name is Gayatri. I have uh, done my master's in neurology and I am here to assist Manisha and also to help all of you in understanding what is this proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. I mean, see, as students, when I was in my uh, bachelor's, talking about PNF was very scary because to remember the term in the exam was very difficult. Forget the patterns, like the dance patterns that they used to teach us, the techniques, the principles, everything was a nightmare. But having said that, when you start understanding about what is PNF, how to apply PNF, it becomes very, very beautiful. Because PNF has the biggest advantage of considering a person and not just the deformity or the disability in the person. Another advantage of this technique as compared to the other techniques is that there is the, it happens in the pain-free range. You know, the technique does not involve pain at all. No matter if you have to talk about, say, cold relax, contract relax, or dynamic reversals, or isometric agonist contraction, or patterns, you know, your deep inflection, deflection, all the Bharatanatyam postures do not involve any pain. And we stop at the range where the patient complains of pain. That's one major benefit of PNF. Uh, I think we spoke about the WW first two Ws of PNF. When was it born and uh, what is PNF per se? Let us now see why PNF. Why should you as a therapist learn about this? Why should one as a therapist learn about it? I mean, for me as a neurological therapist, maybe because I've done my master's in it, I'll be biased towards it. But for an orthopedic or a cardiopulmonary speciality, are they really benefiting from this? Till the last, say, one, two decades, it was confined to only stroke. It was confined to only spinal cord injury. It was confined to only uh, um, the traumatic brain injury, Parkinsonism, only upper motor neuron disorders. Today, the advancement has gone so high the technology has gone leaps and bounds and just like how your uh, apple is upgrading you know to 14 15 16 17 similarly pnf also got upgraded i mean even we have an app store so the pnf application has been increased from just neurological to now athletic and also to post operative orthopedic conditions can you believe that total knee replacements and total hip replacements are um, uh, using PNF as their primary, primary mode of treatment. Post-operative total knee replacement, post-operative total hip replacement, post-operative hemiadroplasties of hip, all of them utilize PNF. Forgive my voice, I will be taking breaks adequately so that you can drink water and I can drink water because I am under the weather. Uh, I'll make sure I don't sound like a robot. But just to tell you that the benefit of PNF is extensive. And if you start applying, you'll see magic. I mean, no wonder why today PNF is one of the most sought after courses. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. 
Sorry. I think, yeah, my network got disconnected. Today, PNF is very, one of the most uh, expensive and sort of the courses in level one and level two. This is what the benefits are. You know, it develops muscular strength. It develops, it, it improves endurance and joint stability and mobility. And it improves coordination, yeah. Uh, just as the term says, neuromuscular facilitation, it also improves coordination. When I mean coordination, PNF is uh, unlike your uh, specific technique in the PNF. The entire proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation involves complete human body activities that mimic your daily activities. How do they mimic? You know the chop, reverse chop, right? That we do uh, for the trunk. For the upper trunk, we do the chop and we do the reverse chop. So when we're doing the chop reverse chop technique, it resembles, why do they call chop and reverse chop? Because in the olden days, you know, the woodcutters, they would go to the forest and they would use the ax and they would do a chop and they would do a reverse chop. They would do chop and reverse chop. That is why the PNF technique is called as a chop reverse chop for upper trunk. And is that the only case? We as um, the Indian households, you know, you have, we had our olden day mothers who would wash the clothes, you know, they would they would strike it against in, in rural areas or semi-rural areas. Even now you can see it. They wash clothes in a way where they go for a chop, they go for a reverse chop. Not just that, any ideal activity you do, it's always a diagonal pattern. You have to pick up something from the shelf. If you have to throw a ball, if you have to catch a ball, or if you have to pick up something from there, anything is a diagonal pattern and your body moves as one unit. Although there is dissociation, it moves as one unit. Therefore, this is the coordination that PNF does. I told you about the applications, not just neurological rehab. You have the rehab for the shoulder, hip and ankle. Today, the ankle rehabilitation or the PNF for the ankle instability Research has shown that there is a significant improvement in the proprioception of the ankle. Because like Manisha said, they work on the proprioceptors. Simple. I told you about pediatric rehab, right? So kids respond excellent to PNF. Kids love PNF. Kids love D1, D2 patterns. Like, like the kids I trade, they love D1, D2 patterns because it, it does not involve any pain. You are not... Doing that, you know, like typically how you stretch a kid, the kid will be crying, the mother will be holding the kid and the therapist is moving, nothing of that sort. Simple dance patterns and they love it. Also, the research has shown that for cardiovascular patients in the elderly, I've not mentioned it here, but the PNF techniques of hold relax and agon the agonist antagonist isometric reversals has brought down the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure significantly. Now, I was reading one paper this morning and it has shown that for the elderly cardiovascular fitness, PNF techniques have been proved very, very beneficial. You know, so that, that's, the, that's the reason why we, we say why PNF, this is why PNF. Why not PNF is what I tell now. Quickly, let us go through the principles. We have another 20 minutes. I'll, I'll try to wind it up as quickly as possible. See, these principles, we should know as therapists. Before we talk about PNF to a, a patient, before explaining what is PNF to a patient, we should know what are the principles. Very simple, universal ones. Uh, even in the level one, level two PNF, these are religiously practiced. Yeah, If you've attended a workshop, you would already be knowing about these. First is manual contact. Manual contact is very, very important. Uh, PNF technique is not a contact guarding technique, which means you let the patient do and you just sit and watch. No, it can't happen like that unless you learn like your agility drills. This has to have a manual contact and where your touch is very important. You want a specific agonist muscle to act. The touch has to happen on the agonist muscle only. The manual contact is placed over the agonist muscle or the tenderness insertion. And you have to direct the movement. It is not necessary that if I want elbow flexion to happen, I will constantly put the hand only on my biceps. Now, along with elbow flexion, if I want a shoulder flexion, I should smoothly change from biceps to deltoid. 
or biceps to anterior deltoid or biceps to pectorals whichever muscle you know that helps in shoulder flexion because see this is the initial movement this is the next movement but for shoulder flexion if you're still keeping it on biceps then you are not targeting the direction of the movement the patient will listen to what you say and the patient will do what you do therefore the touch is very important and the touch should happen in the direction of the movement the direction is what see my end goal is elbow flexion with shoulder flexion if this is what i want for elbow flexion i have placed it on the biceps slowly if i want shoulder flexion along with it gently it has to go towards the anterior deltoid and then touch so that the patient will know or rather both the patient the muscle memory will know which side or what is the direction of the movement now will this apply only to one hand no since god has given us both the hands we have to use both the hands one at the distal one at the proximal you will decide which joint will go first and you will decide what part of the limb will go first and you can place your proximal or distal hand accordingly maximal resistance <clears throat> the amount of resistance applied during the dynamic contraction is greatest amount possible that still allows the movement to smoothly perform without any pain you will not give a resistance beyond what he or she can take simple it always depends on you know you 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 only eat how much you can as long as your hunger allows you to eat will you eat similarly since pnf is not a isometric technique or sole isometric or sole isotonic technique giving resistance like your pre does not work here therefore the maximal resistance should be adjusted that's what the second point says should be adjusted throughout the pattern to accommodate strong and weak components if your agonist is strong your antagonist which is the opposite of it cannot need not be strong you know it will be weak because of the neurophysiological principles that we are going to talk later but if you are focusing on your agonist you also have to focus on your antagonist and adjust the resistance that you are giving accordingly madam i cannot give any resistance i can only touch and tell the patient how to move his or her hand it's good to start with it is not necessary to give resistance all the time see if you are if you are lean and if the patient is obese your resistance is hardly matters to the patient right you might end up falling on the patient therefore make sure that your resistance is adjustable and be smart in targeting that particular muscle group and playing around the muscle groups third will be position and movement of the therapist um it is important yes as in how are you standing with it or in terms of the patient is important because since these pnf techniques or patterns are diagonal patterns it is always advisable if you are also aligned diagonally with the patient just give me a minute i'll just drink some water sorry i told you, you know my voice sounds like a robot suddenly and to sound again like a human i need some water just give me 5 seconds guys now um the therapist while standing diagonally you must face the patient because you will touch the patient wherever possible right for the desired movement that you want and for that you can't be very far away from the patient or neither can you stand away from them very simple must use a wide base range of support naturally if you are at a very you no know, a uh, rigid stance don't end up pouncing on the patient therefore have a wide base of support walk stance position should be enough while you treat the patient with this technique then should be yeah. stretch manisha has already explained us about the physiology that happens when you stretch a muscle see for us as therapists passive stretching active stretching is like you know they they ingrain that when we are studying 
stretch even more ta hold keep pulling keep pulling until the calcaneum comes out in your hand but that's not how the stretch stimulus need to work here it will be a very relaxed but a very consistent stretching without any pain okay uh i can say it will be a dynamic slow stretching it's not a static but it is a dynamic because the muscles are moving although there is a stretch you have the muscles moving but sometimes we give an over pressure at the end range you give a quick stretch or a rapid stretch or over pressure that they call typically that's the over pressure term that they use at the end range just to fire a little more of the uh golgi tendon organs and the muscle spindles so that your uh, nuclear bag and chain fibers and one one day two way to be all of them are stimulated because that can reduce spasticity now that will apply in terms of say high muscle tone or a hypertonia will that apply in hypotonia of course it applies in hypotonia also hypotonia is defined as reduced muscle tone because of reduced motor unit firing giving stretch reflex or a quick stretch every time might not help you need to have a discretion when you're stretching and when the movement is happening when to give a quick stretch see for example if if i need to if i need the patient to open up the hand you know you will have a spastic hand stroke tbi parkinsonism cerebral palsy asd spd is all of them typically have a closed hand and we would want this to improve while giving a pnf technique or a pattern say from d1 extension to sorry d2 extension to d2 flexion when we are going or from from flexion to extension when we are doing i might end up giving a quick stretch or just a, a rapid stretch like that and not to break any joints it's just a a snap a mild snap enough that is enough and that will elicit but should i do it every time not necessary if he or she is listening to you just no need to give any quick stretches or extra stretches timing a sequence of distal to proximal coordinated contractions is very important so uh, you can start from proximal to distal but it is difficult to control the proximal muscles it is easy to control the distal muscles because your trunk and the upper limbs in case of neurological conditions or umn work as an enmash they are not dissociated correct therefore distal to proximal uh, contractions or distal to proximal movement of the group of muscles is more coordinated and brings better results that's why our our d2 pattern or d1 patterns or rather any techniques like eurythmic initiation isometric traversals they work very well in the distal muscle group they take time to show in the proximal muscle group why is that i am not able to understand in hamstrings i am not able to understand in gluteals i can understand very well in my biceps and triceps that is because of the bulk of the muscle that you have and those are the proximal muscle groups your glutea your hams are more towards the trunk they have lot of their jobs the biceps and triceps have minimal function and they are thinner muscles you don't have many other muscles around you can elicit the contraction beautifully there but that does not mean you shouldn't do proximal to distal choice is yours patient is yours be smart and discreet whatever you can does traction help um traction is a very slight separation you know uh, just like your uh, maitland and syriac have told it's gentle traction you just can't pull the the joint articular surfaces out of the socket but theoretically it is to inhibit pain and facilitate movement during the movement pattern it is okay i don't give traction to all of my patients but if you feel that moving causes pain just try a mild traction and see a gentle traction should elicit the pain because there's already stretching of the capsule happening and if there is no much wrap or rubbing off the articular surfaces and when there is synovial fluid passing through them there is reduced pain that's the whole point of using traction approximation uh, approximation is the opposite of traction the gentle compression of joint surfaces by either manual compression or weight bearing joint the movement stimulates the co contraction of the agonist and the antagonist same principle what mat activities follow same principle what the ndt follows same principle what your inhibitory techniques follow see you have the overlapping of the principles because ultimately weight bearing or compression of joints 
will reduce the tone and also will increase the tone. So for the lack of better words, you know, the approximation will normalize the muscle tone. Why? How do they do it? Because of the contraction of agonist and antagonist to enhance dynamic stability and postural control. Why are muscle mechanoreceptors, pressure receptors, proper receptors, joint receptors, all receptors ultimately have to work to maintain a balance and coordination. That's all what B and N, F are signifying. Finally, verbal commands. Verbal commands are very important. So you just can't keep touching the patient and understand. You think that, yeah, your patient will understand how to move and he or she will move on their own. You have to talk. Talking is very, very important, right? So auditory commands and cues are given to enhance motor output and sharp verbal command is given. And when I mean sharp, it should be crisp. Just talk the word that he or she will understand and that what you want. Simple. If you want it to move, 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 out, 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 bend, 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 bend. That's it. That's all what you have to talk. Visual cues. Yes, patient is asked to follow the movement uh, uh, of the limb with both hand and the eye because he or she should see what they're doing because the visual feedback gets registered and that registration is important for memorizing the movement. Why, when does this work? Again, in the neurological conditions, specifically in the UMN. Um, will, is it necessary in cardiovascular? Is it necessary in pediatric? Depends. It depends on how uh, coherent is the patient, how is the sensorium of the patient. But visual cues and verbal commands are extremely important. No matter how good a therapist I am, if I'm not able to communicate what I want from the patient, then uh, God bless the country. Now, uh, this question is the last question for today. And I want you all to answer it. See, it's, it, uh, I don't believe in talking too much of technique. I only want to know if you know what is the end goal of PNF. Quickly comment, how does PNF contribute to functional activities in daily living? A, by not improving muscle atrophy, by increasing joint stiffness, by improving motor and functional coordination, none of the above. You have the answer there only. If you're smart enough, you would have already typed the answer. Uh, I will wait for like five seconds. I don't drink water now. Don't worry. My voice is better. But I've been talking about ADL, ADL all through. So I think we will get some responses now. Last question, huh? by the way. I I will not. Um, now, how does PNF contribute to ADL? ADL are... Activities of daily living. I told you, for any ADL, coordination is extremely important. If you have to pick up something from a shelf, your hands, your body, your eyes, and your brain should be coordinated. Therefore, the movement is happening in a coordinated function, right? And what is the output? It's the motor output. Your muscles are acting. Because of the sensory impulses, the motor output is happening. Therefore, it, the PNF improves motor function and coordination in the ADL activity. Does it improve muscle by not improving muscle atrophy? It, it, it reduces muscle atrophy, right? Increasing joint stiffness? Definitely not. It reduces joint stiffness. Therefore, for this, the right answer would be C because it improves coordination. That's all what I've been talking about. Quickly, the last two slides uh, for today will be the neurophysiological principles. These are very, very important for five mark answers and 10 mark answers. So any students listening to me, to keep a note of this and make sure you write these points. If I am your examiner, I will give you. Okay? So these are just your five mark answers. Any university, very, very important question. What are the principles while you stretch? I told you you're stretching, but... There is the effect of a stretch on the muscle. That effect will continue no matter how much is of the strength and how much is the duration of the stretch of the stimulus is. If Even if my st stimulus is for five seconds, the, the result or the response continues in the muscle and that is what is after discharge. The effect of a stimulus continues even after the stimulus is stopped. For example, there's a mosquito. It comes, it bites. You immediately either hit or you scratch. It, has, it, it, it will bite you and it will fly away. But does the effect stay? It stays. You end up scratching, you end up rubbing and then you will feel better. After discharge. This is a simple example I had to give you because it will stay in your mind. 
Now, this feeling of increased power within a muscle that comes after a stimulus is maintained and this is very, very important for a muscle to have an improved range of motion or a joint to have an improved range of motion. Exactly. This is called after discharge. The second principle will be temporal summation. You know what is temporal summation, spatial summation constantly. You would have been hearing by now. Temporal means a collection or a succession of multiple weak stimuli happening in a very short period of time. No, a weak stimulus, weak stimulus, weak stimulus, weak stimulus. So continuously, one after the other, if there is a weak stimulus being sent, like a, a, a weak, 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 one after the other. If there are 10 weak stimulus have, uh, which are attacking the motor unit of a muscle, they combine, they summit to form an excitation because your norms and muscles follow a rule called all or none law, correct? So unless it reaches a, a threshold potential, there won't be an excitation happening. The action potential is not generated in the muscle. For that to happen, the temporal summation happens in the body sometimes, wherein maybe weak stimuli have a targeting the motor unit, targeting, targeting, and then finally when they accumulate the necessary excitation, you will have the action potential. So what is a spatial summation? Uh, this is the uh, a little reverse of temporal, but not complete. When I mean spatial summation, when the weak stimuli are applied simultaneously on the different parts of the body, they reinforce each other and cause excitation. Most of the times, this, this spatial and the temporal summation, they can combine for a bigger activity. For example, say if, you have, if I have to pick up a pen, this pen does not require multiple stimuli over all over my body. It only requires a weak stimulus or a submaximal stimulus for me, for or for my muscles of the hand, the tiny muscles, for them to pick up the pen. But if I have to pick up a 10 kg bag, that is when there have to be multiple stimuli. You know, my core should be proper, my lower limbs should be proper, my neck should be proper, my hands should be proper. There has to be multiple firing happening to many muscles in the body so that my body is prepared to pick up a 10 kg bag. That is a spatial summation. But isn't temporal summation happening there? It is. There are weak stimuli happening. There are, there are multiple stimuli happening for all over the motor units in the body, depending on the activity or the end result I want. Similarly, in PNF, if you want a proximal muscle group to be targeted, that is when spatial summation will occur. If you only want a distal muscle group or a very tiny muscle group, like your cold relax or contract relax, or say slow reversal hold, you need temporal, temporal summation should be enough. No, that's that's the beauty of the human body. Right? It adapts according to the function or the necessity. Irradiation, yeah, I told you, right? So the next principle will be there is a spread and increased strength of a response. Now, once when you give a stimulus to a muscle, there will be a response. That is after discharge. This response can be either reduced response or excited response, which means either the muscle can be inhibited from the movement or excited. Either the muscle do not move at all or the muscle will jerk. That is called irradiation. This strength can be either ways because of the kind of motor units we, fire, we, we target and the kind of impulse contraction is happening and the kind of action potentials that are generated within the muscle fiber because there are so many sarcomia units and if the upper motor neuron uh, system that's the central nervous system is not functioning well that is when the radiation can have either an excitation or an inhibition usually for a normal person if you are you know you do an isometric hold isometric isometric hold there will be an excitation because the strength has been improved and that irradiation will lead to excitation. But does that happen all the time? No, madam. Sometimes even if I do an isometric hold and the moment I release my resistance, that's all. The hand flaps down. That is also the matter because of the firing that's happening. And because of hypotonia or because of, say, for example, in GBS. GBS, why, they, why is the hypotonia? Because of the Schwann sheath, which is getting disrupted. 
Similarly, in the spinal cord injury, Schwann sheet is intact. Why hypotonia? Because of the nerve conduction that is not happening from the spinal cord to that of the peripheral nerves. This correlation is very important. That is when you will know when to apply, uh, what technique, what will happen, either is it an increased impulse or reduced impulse, so on and so forth. She spoke about, Manisha spoke about reciprocal inhibition and autogenic inhibition. So I'll not go quick, I'll go very quickly. Next comes successive induction, which is an increased excitation of the agonist muscles follows the stimulation or contraction of the antagonist. It is not always the case. Um, say, for example, in reverse, uh, in reversal of antagonist, what you do is you play between the agonist and the antagonist. You know, you 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 kind of swap your hand like this, and you play between agonist and antagonist. When you are targeting the agonist, the antagonist will calm down a little. Yes, it will, because the impulses are are towards the agonist. The agonist is firing more than the antagonist, but the moment the agonist relaxes, the antagonist picks up. Successive induction. There's an increased excitation on the antagonist when the agonist relaxes. Similarly, there's an increased excitation in the agonist while the antagonist is relaxed. Uh, this co-contraction happens very uh, uniformly in you and I, but this is what is impacted in case of Parkinsonism, in case of traumatic brain injury, because they end up either having rigidity or hypertonicity. In them, your agonist and antagonist are contracted. For them, you will have to target one first, even though the, uh, the antagonist is picking up in contraction, and you, initially you will end up seeing even more rigid limb. That is when target the agonist, make sure that you, you only focus either on contract relax or either on hold relax or just a dynamic reversal or just a slow isometric hold to calm down the functioning of the antagonist, increase weight bearing, and then you perform the slow reversal hold again. Then you perform the reversal of antagonist. Make sure that the tone is coming down. When you normalize the tone along with these techniques, then you will see the principle happening properly in the cases of UMNL. Reciprocal inhibition, contraction of muscles is accompanied by the inhibition of the antagonist. That's, that's the simple rule that happens. And this is a necessary part of coordinated motion. In you and I, usually uh, since... Uh, we are so-called normals, although none of us are normal in the own beautiful way. But no offense, I'm just, I'm just kidding. If the agonist contracts, the antagonist will relax and vice versa. So now just fix it as they do relax. That's the reciprocal inhibition. These are the major neurophysiological principles of PNF. And with this, we come to the end of the part one of PNF. See, I didn't want to bombard you with too much of information, neither me or Manisha, because this has to go slowly. And bit by bit, if we understand, it becomes better for us to implement it. Too much of overload of information, we get confused at the end of the day. Um, this was a brief about what you should understand before understanding the techniques. And till now, we've just spoke about PNF, PNF, PNF. Now, let's talk about what we are, PRA, KARA. Uh, what we do here is not just PNF. We, we do a lot more than PNF. Uh, these are what we do. We help in improving the understanding ability of the physiotherapists to tell you simply. So we work on the curriculum of the physiotherapy. We assist physiotherapy students and practicing professionals, eh, both in their academics and in their clinical reasoning also. And we try to correlate clinical reasoning with their academics because that's what physiotherapists are all about. You know, Reading PNF and applying PNF is very different. Similarly, reading about ACL rehab, applying about ACL rehab is very different. Reading about ACBT and applying ACBT is very different. But for that, you should know what ACBT is. That's what we are here for. And we are not just for the academics. We are also there to help in terms of assessment. We do whatever little we know. We try to help people across the country. Some students, yeah, they are still our, one of our fans and they are consistent fans and they, they help us in growing. And I hope now anyone who's joined this family will help in getting themselves and us grow better. So with that, we come to the end of the presentation. Let me stop sharing now. Let me show my face.
Okay. And any doubts, you, you have our WhatsApp group. You can post on our WhatsApp group. We are there 24 7 on it. I am there. Manisha is there on the group. We will, we will help you in uh, clearing your doubts. If we do not know, we will read, we will ask, and then we will get back to you. But we will not let you know. We ask someone else. That's all, folks. Thank you so much for taking your time, your personal time, and joining us on the PN part one webinar. See you in part two series. Make sure you read up and come. We'll also tell you the pre-reads, what you should know, because by then you'll forget all the principles. If I ask you the neurophysiological principles, then no one will answer. Therefore, read up and come, not just for me, but for your patients. Good luck. Thank you and take care.